On today's episode of Health Accelerated, it's a different kind of house call from a medical provider. You may have heard it referred to as telehealth, which actually isn't a new idea or need. The concept of home-based medical care was mentioned as early as 1879 in a Lancet article about using the telephone to reduce unnecessary office visits. In 1925, doctors were diagnosing patients via radio. But to say we've come a long way since those earlier days would be an understatement to say the least. Joining me to discuss virtual urgent care are Susan Wolf, Clinical Director of Digital Care for OSF On Call, and Katie Hendricks, Lead Provider of Digital Care for OSF On Call. Welcome to you both. Before we get started, why don't you give me a little bit of background about each of you and how you got to this point in your healthcare, if you will, journey. Susan, let's start with you. Yes, thank you for having us. So I have been with OSF since 2007. I started off as a baby nurse extern uh, on the cardiac floor inpatient at St. Francis Medical Center. And from there, I became a nurse on that same floor. Um, I continued to kind of grow and challenge myself, charge nurse, and then, you know, of course, wanted something more. So I thought, okay, I want to be a family nurse practitioner. So I went back to my uh, nurse practitioner school at St. Francis College of Nursing to get my master's. Um, and then in that time frame, I did go to the emergency room. I went down there as a nurse to get more rather than just cardiac. You know, there's neuro down there, there's babies down there. We don't really see that on the adult cardiac floor. So I really wanted to expand kind of what uh, my scope was and understanding of medicine as a nurse transitioning, transitioning into that family nurse practitioner role. Um, and then when I graduated, I became a primary care nurse practitioner in Metamora at the OSF Medical Group there. A uh, physician and I had that practice for a couple of years. And I still, again, just wanted more. I just th- thought, you know, it's a small practice. I kind of want to get a little bit more involved and uh, really grow my clinical knowledge and exposure to certain patient types. So um, in 2016, OSF Healthcare started offering APP fellowship programs, and their first track was in the primary care track. So I knocked on Lisa Pierce and Melinda Cooling's door and said, please let me in. I'm not a new grad, but I have a year of experience, and I'd love to join, and they let me in. Um, And so after that, I, again, loved kind of that world as well. So I did part-time in clinic seeing patients and part-time helping out with growing the fellowship program in that primary care tract as a clinical educator for APPs under Lisa Pierce's team. Um, And then after serving in those roles for a couple of years, uh, an opportunity opened up with On Call. Uh, So that was in 2019 in September, and um, I started off with urgent care, on-call urgent care and the brick and mortar being their clinical director. And that was for about four years until recently. Um, This summer, I went ahead and transitioned into the digital care uh, realm and clinical director role. And so I knew somewhat about the virtual urgent care because we assisted with that in the brick and mortar as well, Um, but also now am more involved in it in this role. And we'll get back to the difference between the brick and mortar versus the virtual in a moment. But first of all, I'm exhausted just listening to that career path. (laughs) You love learning is what I get out of the bottom line. You love learning. And that is awesome. Uh, So Katie, we're going to come to you. Give us a little of your background. Yeah, of course. So similar to Susan, I started as a nurse with OSF about 10 years ago on the floor. I loved it. I've always loved direct patient care. I think there's so much reward to um, that bedside nursing. And I think there's so much value as I became a clinician just to having those relationships with the patients. So I really enjoyed um, that. But then I continued and pursued my education as a family nurse practitioner through um, UIC and graduated in 2018 and started in primary care. I was part of the primary care fellowship, and Susan was an educator at that time. So, um, along with Lisa Pierce being an educator as well, and it was a, a wonderful experience. So, I worked out of Brimfield and in Peoria, at two different primary care clinics. Really enjoyed that. I, I loved it's very similar to bedside nursing, that patient care, direct talking with patients directly. And I would say at that time, if you asked me if I'd go into digital medicine, I would have said absolutely not. I love my patients. I like to hug them. I like to talk to them. (laughs) Um, And I would have never, never pursued it. I, I always thought being next to the patient is the way to go. And then COVID hit. So we all kind of felt that, that everything changed and at that time, 
um, throughout my whole primary care, I was helping to pick up in the urgent cares um, as if previously known as Ergo, and now on-call urgent care was starting to build up, I would go and help out. And I loved the fast-paced nature. It was it was so fun to just see such a variety walk in the door um, and just not never knowing what your day was going to look like. So I transitioned, um, a position came open there, and I transitioned to the urgent care and then quickly transitioned to our COVID digital response team, um, which was a virtual response team to COVID. And I saw so much value. We helped so many patients that were at home, not sure what to do. And I saw you really can make an impact and develop a relationship even without being right next to them, holding their hand or talking with them and having that physical touch. So that's what really motivated me to pursue digital even further. And actually after COVID ended, um, connecting with the virtual urgent care and then ultimately my role where we look at the connect programs as well as the, the urgent care. So It's been a weird journey. (laughs) Before this conversation even develops, I just hear your passion and enthusiasm. So already that tells me this is going to be a great conversation. So (laughs) let's start with what exactly is virtual urgent care? You've referenced the brick and mortar urgent care. So how is virtual urgent care different? So virtual urgent care is meeting the patient where they're at um, when they want the care. So this could be at two in the morning with a crying baby. This could be at five in the afternoon at their daughter's softball game. You know, anything can happen at any time. And there's somebody always there to support you with that clinical diagnosis. Um, and they can connect with you, uh, via obviously a smartphone or technology that way. And it can be an asynchronous visit or, you know, a texting kind of chat conversation or a synchronous visit where it can be even a video chat, something where be where the provider would like to actually lay eyes on the patient, maybe talk to the mom, watch the child breathe, look at the rash, anything like that. Yeah, obviously I should clarify that yes, other than you're not physically walking into a building, it is all virtual. But that brings up the other question. There'll be a lot of people who will say, oh, do I need technology? How do I connect with you? How do I work through this if I don't have technology? Talk a little bit about that process on coming to the diagnosis and how you determine exactly what's going on. That's a good point. It's a, it's actually very user-friendly. So it is once you've done it one time, it, it we see that a lot in the feedback from the patients. You really, you can use a smart device, you can use a computer, you can use a tablet, um, anything with a web browser, really, you can log in and, and have that conversation. Like Susan mentioned, we do both um, asynchronous, which is where asynchronous is where you would fill out an online survey with a list of questions, and then we would provide a diagnosis and treatment plan for you. Um, and within that, it may be that we have a question that we want to ask you and we uh, start a chat conversation where we're essentially texting back and forth saying, asking additional questions, or we can escalate it to a video visit because we may want to see what's going on with that patient particularly, or the patient can just start as a video visit if they don't want to necessarily go through that process of the questions, or they have something that maybe doesn't quite line up with the the suggested options on the page, they can always start a video visit and we can um, just immediately connect with the patient. Yeah, I think that would probably be very fascinating that you don't necessarily need to go eyeball to eyeball to somebody Mm -hmm. initially, because some people may not be comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. They may, you know how some people are, they they don't want to be a bother, but I think something might be going on. And so I just want to ask this question. Do you see that happening, kind of that anonymity a little bit where they just kind of need a little help off to the side and then it grows into something more? Yes, I feel as though they, like like Katie had mentioned, once they have that first point of contact, they get that trust. They can't gain that ability of not only trusting themselves to utilize the device and the service that we provide, but then also the trust in our care team as well, um, that there's going to be a diagnosis at the end, that there are next steps, that there is follow-up, we answer questions, and that we're always there for them. Um, so it continues to kind of build and build off of that. And I know Katie also had mentioned that it's very user-friendly for the patient, but I also feel as though like the providers also have a very user-friendly experience with this platform as well. Who are the patients that we are seeing primarily? I I could see a benefit Mm -hmm. if I'm a young mom and, you know, something happens and it's the middle of the night and I don't want to have to bundle my baby up and drag them out in the cold. So is it that, are we seeing pediatrics and kids? Are we seeing older people who may not want to venture out? What's our patient population that we're seeing? I think you'd be surprised because I would agree with you. I would, you constantly think of that image of, um, maybe younger tech savvy that's going to text something in, but we see everywhere. I mean, I've seen 99 year olds, I've seen newborns uh, through the platform. So it really is, it's very user friendly, even if you don't, you're not very tech savvy. Um, 
I would we see everybody. I, there's not like a specific group that we continuously see over and over, but we really just see that wide array. Is this something that takes the pressure off of emergency departments, do you think? Because I would think in years past, if you didn't have this to access, where are you going in the middle of the night? Really, your only choice is to go to an emergency department. So is this helping alleviate some of that pressure? I believe it definitely is. Um, I don't have any specific numbers, especially across the ministry, but I do know even at the local level where we currently uh, reside in the Peoria region, in the central region, it has definitely offset um, quite a bit of patients to this virtual setting rather than going to the brick and mortar, the ED, that face-to-face type of typical traditional type of visit that they have been used to. Are there certain conditions that are better treated through virtual urgent care or now, I would imagine if there's a break of a leg, you're, you're going to have to go to a brick and mortar. But what are the predominant conditions that we are diagnosing, or is there any limit to it other than an obvious break or you know heart attack, stroke, those mm-hmm. kind of things, obviously? What are we seeing? I would say right now we see a lot of sick symptoms like those cold, sinus, uh, upper respiratory infections we see quite a bit, and that kind of goes with the the flow of illness and sick season. But we can really see quite a bit. We see like female UTIs is a, a really good one and a convenient one for the woman that's out at work and they're having symptoms. They don't have time to run into the, the office to get a, um, all the testing and the that interaction done so we can treat them while they're, they're on the run, taking care of everybody else. Mm-hmm. We can take care of them. Um, but we really, the, there are the limitations of those like severe, if somebody's having chest pain, stroke-like symptoms, we certainly want them in the best place. Um, and we would refer them. So that's another thing that's important is if they log in and maybe it's not appropriate and we really think they need that higher level of care in an emergency room, we would then refer them and not charge them for that visit. So we, we would provide them with the guidance as to where and maybe how soon we need to see you. So maybe it is an urgent care in the morning to get an x-ray or whatever it may be, um, or it could be the emergency room that evening, but we would provide that here's the level of care we feel you need and this is kind of the timeline that we would recommend it on. Do you find there's a reassurance with that when you've had those types of situations? Because, you know, I can also see people being like, oh, wait, I sliced my finger open. Should I? Shouldn't I? What am I going to do? And do you feel like there's that reassurance conveyed that they know that, okay, I know I should go to the emergency department, but I'm trying to avoid it. But then you say, no, you really need to go get this sewn up or whatever. Do you get that sense coming back through the line to you? Definitely. I would say we we provide quite a bit of reassurance either way. So if we're able to say, sometimes people will just call in and say, do you think I can? this can wait until the morning or is this something that I need to be seen right now for or can you take care of it? And oftentimes we're able to either take care of it or provide that a little bit of reassurance on as to where to go. And I think that helps just calm others in the community. I think that's one of the biggest things, even as a mom myself, that I think, oh, what should I do? And it's nice to have somebody else just available at the tips of your fingers versus having to to wait and call in. Yeah, with us still being medical, I think as soon as it's our own kids, our <laughs> medical brain falls out the window and then we rely on what else, what's out there. We rely on call a phone a friend or reach out to the services that are out there. You brought up something earlier about kind of how you progress through this journey during COVID. I would imagine there were a lot of lessons learned through the care we provided during COVID and standing up those COVID care lines. And yeah, it was a lot of learning taking place and happening quick. Does that translate into this setting and the virtual urgent care and learning to just talk and comfort people and talk them through things? Are you finding the translation between what we learned during the pandemic, which was a lot, to the world now? Very much so. I would say Mm -hmm. even like the world we always say within our department, the world of digital care is ever changing. Every day we have new information and new things that we're trying out and new protocols that we're able to treat digitally that a year ago we would have probably said, no way, we won't be able to do that. But now we're able to. So I think we'll continue to see that evolve and, and continue to learn like we learned from everything within that COVID pandemic and how to assess patients when they're not right in front of you. Um, and using the day-to-day, what we learn day-to-day to to help just improve and continue to grow and expand what we can care for digitally. I would think one of the skills that has grown is probably the one around mental health. 
you probably don't think a lot about it, but sometimes I would think people just want somebody to talk to, somebody to listen to what's going on with them. Did you find that to be the case sometimes? During, during the COVID digital response, um, I was pregnant during that time, so I was with Katie, but then I kind of left her high and dry to <laughs> care for those patients. But um, we definitely dealt with a lot of that kind of panic and give me some answers. It's a lot of the fear, the unknown. Um, and then translating into the current state today, yes, obviously that has left us as a community in this nation, across the world even, um, with that different type of uh, level of concern maybe with health, with questions that need to be answered and maybe the, the time that I need it. So I feel as though we are there to answer those questions um, and to support them. And like you had mentioned, Shelley, to provide that reassurance. Um, I don't know if Katie, you have anything other eyes experience to add, but. Yeah, I would agree with that. Just providing reassurance. I think having someone to talk to is good for anybody to bounce your ideas off of and not be sitting there. I think one of the things we talked about emergency rooms and you think, how, how long do you think before you go to the emergency room? If it's not a critical concern at 2 a.m., you Oftentimes you're talking with, you know, a family member, a friend, like, oh, should I do it? Should I not? And we kind of take that hour long back and forth stress out of it. And you can just call and and maybe we do say, yeah, it's time to go to the emergency room or maybe we're able to, to treat and take care of you and help just mitigate that stress. How does the process work if some of that treatment involves a prescription? Because sometimes you need something more than, you know, the, the Tylenol or ibuprofen that's in your closet or in your medicine cabinet there. How does that work with prescriptions and prescribing for people and, and getting all of that to them? Because sometimes that's necessary. Yeah, as Katie mentioned during the checklist process in the beginning, uh, one of those steps is, you know, your allergies, your history, um, past medical history, your pharmacy of choice. So that way, at the very end of the visit, we don't have to, we can verify the pharmacy. So see, I, I, I see you chose CVS or Walgreens or so on. Um, is this correct? And then so we can verify the pharmacy. We can go over the uh, medication management that we are going to prescribe them. And then we can say, okay, this is going to be sent to your pharmacy. If by happenstance that maybe it's that 10 o'clock p.m. money spot where maybe some are closing, some are staying open. You know, there's 24-hour pharmacies less and less these days. So we can always kind of work with the patient to say, well, where do you live? Where can we get this to you so you can get it now? Get that first dose in before you get to bed tonight um, so you can start feeling better. So there's a lot of working through a lot of things on this. Um, so insurance and cost. You know, a trip to the emergency department is not inexpensive. Hmm. What are the costs for virtual urgent care, and is insurance in play with this? So there's several insurers that are on board with digital medicine. Our cost outright is $25. It's a cash option to have that asynchronous. So that's that medical interview that we that you're asked a series of questions based on your concern. It's sent to a provider, and then the provider is going to send you back a response with a treatment plan in there, which may include prescriptions. It may include whatever is deemed necessary. Um, if that visit is escalated, so say we do want to ask you a couple more questions, the cost remains $25. So it wouldn't be increased if we have additional questions questions. The option to do a video visit from the start is $50 as a cash option. So that would be assuming you have no insurance coverage um, or your insurance, maybe you have a high deductible, something like that, that would um, limit what you can do as far as that initial cost. If you do have insurance, you would put your insurance in at the front and then it would give you a cost. So it really is just dependent on your, your insurer, but it's listed on the front of our page, all the different payers, and um, you'd have to put in your information to determine that that cost but the max is 25 and 50 respectively okay and so it is accepted so that's good mm -hmm. to know up front how long does a typical visit if there is such a thing is a typical visit on average what is a visit for virtual urgent care time-wise it varies based on which type so if you choose the medical interview we, I will say, I'll brag on my, our clinicians a little bit. They're very quick. Um, they're very, very quick to respond to visits. We're very fortunate to have a great team that works really hard to get get patients their care quickly. Um, usually, we have a response within like ten minutes to to patients on that medical interview, and that's probably even lofty. We we usually have it in a little bit less. If it's a video visit, it really depends on what's going on with that patient, but it's usually. 15 to 20 minutes max as far as how long it takes, um, sometimes much shorter and sometimes longer depending on how complex the patient concern is. All right, let's talk about some of those stories from the front line. Like I said, when we were initially, when I was asking you about your background, I can hear the passion and the care and your enthusiasm for healthcare. There have to be stories that you take away from your work 
in the virtual urgent care space that just stay in your heart or stay with you. Tell me about some of those. It is definitely a great, uh, that's, that's probably the best part of the whole journey here is just to hear how positively it impacts our patients and our communities out there. So uh, specifically, I know that there was a patient that um, showed some recognition to our team to say how much she appreciated the service because it was about that 7 a.m. You know, you never know when something will hit. You know, your kids are doing great in the morning and then all of a sudden something happens, whether it's a fever or pain or something like that. Um, they fall off the couch and, you know, what what do I need to, you know, go to the emergency room right now or wait for primary care to open at 8 a.m., but my job starts at 8 a.m. So she was actually able to um, call uh, into virtual urgent care and be connected with a provider before uh, her shift started at 8 a.m. Uh, I believe she was a nurse at the hospital as well. So obviously we need to get those patients or those nurses to the front lines. That way they can provide that patient care. Um, but also the child needed to get to where she needed to go so she could be watched um, throughout the day. So she called in. Um, gave the symptoms to the provider and they said that, you know, we're going to go ahead and call you in this antibiotic. This is what it is. Um, go ahead and send it to the pharmacy. The pharmacy had it done within 20 minutes and she was able to get the child to daycare. Um, she was able to get to work. Everyone was on time and the child was feeling better by even the end of the day. So she was very thankful to be able to get the child what she needed, start feeling better, have that reassurance that the child was going to be feeling okay and that she could get into her work and do what her role was for that day as well. And she didn't need to take the day off. Correct. And so it, it didn't have that trickle down effect. You're right. Cause there would have been a trickle down effect if that would have happened Yes. on somebody else. Katie, how about you? Anything stand out? Any stories stand out? Yeah, I would say I recently had um, a mom that I love the nighttime stories. I would say just because you feel like you can provide so much reassurance and we're kind of one of the only options, you know, you're not, you can't, you don't have as many places you can go in the middle of the night. And one of, I had, had a mom who had a daughter that fell and cut her chin um, in the middle of the night. They were an hour from the closest emergency room and just wondering, do I actually need to go? Do I not? Um, and it was it was nice to provide that reassurance. She didn't need to go. I could provide her with that wound care recommendations and keep the child at home in the middle of the night, keeping mom getting her a little bit of rest, I'm sure. <laughs> Maybe not the full night, but a little bit of rest and that reassurance where she didn't then have to go sit in an emergency room, drive an hour both ways. Um, I, those are always just really rewarding because we're able to make a pretty big impact on that patient's life at that moment. So what do both of you like about providing care this way? You talked about your passion for the bedside nursing. So this is different. What do you like about providing care through the virtual urgent care space? And do you see it expanding even? My specific passion about this space is, I, again, I was very similar to Katie. I love that bedside, that face-to-face -face interaction just provides a, a deeper level of that connectivity and that trust with that relationship. So yes, there's a learning curve to figure out how to develop that trusting relationship with the patient in a virtual sense, whether that's asynchronous or synchronous. However, what really excites me is the clinical gusto that is backing all of this protocol medicine behind what the providers are giving to these patients in our communities. So when you think of, Katie mentioned, you know, a female UTI, well, well, how can I do that without getting my urine dipped and making sure that this is actually what it is? So there is so much data and science and research behind it to really support these protocols that are in place to provide this evidence-based virtual care. So it's very exciting to provide that, but also educate the patients that this is acceptable. This is okay. We do not have to have these diagnostic tests in every situation, which also ramps up their costs as well as our healthcare costs as well. Katie? Yep, I think those are wonderful points. And then from um, that patient care side, I, I just really love the connections. The patients are inviting us into their lives and inviting us into their homes, which provides an intimate connection just just be, by doing that. And I think it allows patients to open up a lot and you develop those relationships, which is what I fell in love with initially at that bedside. So I really think providing that access to them where they are at and having them invite us into their lives at that point is really, it's really rewarding. Mm -hmm. So as a final question, how do you see this transforming healthcare, the virtual urgent care space? How is that transforming and innovating when it comes to healthcare? It's truly, you think of it as a, a disruptive model in the sense, because it's not what we're currently used to, but as you even opened up with, this is somewhat of how 
medicine used to be. So it's really kind of opening our eyes and being agile to the changes that are coming on because of maybe new illnesses, like you mentioned that we had a pandemic, you know, not too long ago. Um, but also what are the, what are the patient's needs rather than what do we need as a healthcare system to be sustainable? Well, we actually need to flip that around. What do the patients need? Because we need to meet them where they're at, when they want to connect with us and how they want to connect with us. And we need to make sure that is a clinically evidence-based supported experience, but also a patient-friendly experience as well. So I feel as though this is just going to continue to grow, not only in the protocols that we can um, support them from a medical standpoint, but also just that ease of experience too is going to continue to improve as we learn about more uh, technology that's out there. I would agree. I think that will continue to grow just from a standpoint of what we've seen over the past year in our protocol development and the things that, that researchers are doing to expand our digital opportunities, I think we'll continue to see grow. And I think people are busy. I mean, it's hard to to stop your day to get in to go mm -hmm. somewhere. So we're providing that access point where you can call us, we can take care of you rather quickly, um, and you can go about your day, which I think is vital in our current, current state to be able to provide that. Mm -hmm. Susan Wolf, Katie Hendricks, thank you for this conversation and, and just educating us about where the path has been and where it is going. It, it will continue to evolve, I'm sure, and we appreciate you taking time to come talk to us about it. Yes, thank you thank for having you. us. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Health Accelerated, brought to you by OSF Healthcare. Listen and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. You can also find links to any of our episodes at osfinnovation.org slash healthaccelerated.